Um, just to give the context, I, I am a medical herbalist and a hypnotherapist and a druid and now an author as well. So um, I wrote this book really, the point of this book is to remind the reader how entangled our roots are with those of the hedgerows. And the point of this is, or the reason I want this known, is that nature heals. And nature heals not only on a physical level, but also on a soul level. Um, in my practice as a medical herbalist, most of my patients are burnt out, their adrenaline levels are soaring, and they're full of anxiety. And they're really craving the serenity of the nature connection. But the problem is with our society, we're now so isolated from nature that they can't find that way home. And um, there's also a very great joy to be, to be um, had when we connect on a deeper level with nature. But again, our developed society, we've almost completely forgotten that that, that, that joy exists. So um, one of the ways back to nature is through remembering our relationship with plants. And I'm going to give you an example now of, of Hawthorne. So if you can just try to imagine yourself, I live in Hampshire, so come for a walk with me through the Hampshire com countryside. And we're walking now through the fields and the meadows, and we come across um, a very thorny, misshapen tree. And really, you're not going to take an awful lot of notice of this tree, you just carry on past. But imagine that you've learned that the name of this tree is Crataegus monogyna, and so you might name it as you go past, and possibly you might feel a tiny bit clever. And then, perhaps as you're walking past the tree, you might remember that a friend of yours collected the berries in the late summer and she cooked it down as a jam and then she poured it into a baking tray, a very thin layer, and put it in the oven to dry and then she rolled it up and she made a fruit leather which you can tear and eat and it's a delicious snack. So now you look at the tree and you look at it with a sense of appreciation. And then perhaps you might have used the leaves and the flowers to control your high blood pressure and it's kept your blood pressure low or normal or perhaps you've used the leaves and the berries to support a heart, a, a physical heart of someone you're very fond of perhaps that person's heart is very weak and um, Hawthorne is known as the mother of the old heart so it gives that heart strength so now you look at Hawthorne with a degree of gratitude because it's healing and then perhaps you, you learn that Hawthorne is associated with the Celtic ceremony of Beltane. So Beltane is a ceremony that's happening now, around about the 1st of May. And it is, it's been going on for thousands of years. And it's said that in times gone by, every hilltop right across the whole of Britain, the bonfires, the Beltane fires were lit on Beltane Eve. And so you can imagine the whole land was, was reignited, was woken up with the Beltane fires. And the point of Beltane is it's bringing together the god and the goddess. It's a fertility ceremony. They're coming together to fertilize the land. Really, the goddess is the earth, the land. And so the people of Britain would would build these huge big bonfires and they would dance around the bonfires and they'd drive their cattle through the bonfires and they would leap the Beltane fires as well. And they would also, they were always invoking at the whole time, invoking the god and the goddess to, to come together to fertilize the land. And so they would materialize that. They would choose a young maiden from the village and they would dress her up in bowers of hawthorn flowers because you've probably noticed at this time of the year the hawthorn is full of blossom and so her name, her other name is May, May Blossom or sometimes she's known as Bride. So the, the, the May Queen is dressed up in bowers of hawthorn blossom and she meets the May King and they make love and so they've brought the, the, the god and the goddess together and the couples may, you know, people, the villagers may dance around the bell ten fires and then they sneak off into the darkness and they also make love. It's a fertility c ceremony. And then in the morning when the Beltane fires are down, they would gather the ash and they would take it back to their fields and they would throw it on their fields. And you see, the whole land was blessed with the ceremony. Then perhaps we turn to the Christians and um, we remember the Glastonbury legend where 
Joseph of Arimathea, he was the wealthy uncle of Jesus. So Jesus was crucified, Joseph went to the Romans and he asked for the body, and because he was wealthy, he, 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 they embalmed Jesus in the aloes and the myrrh, and he put Jesus in his own tomb. Now Joseph was wealthy because he used to um, trade tin with the, with, with the people of Cornwall, so he knew the west of Britain, and they say that he knew um, Glastonbury as well. So you can imagine, there's been the crucifixion, he went and got the body, embalmed it, put it in the tomb. He's pretty traumatised, this guy, and his, and his entourage. They, they come in his boats, they flee the Holy Land, they come to Britain, and they land at Glastonbury, which in those days, in the, the Celtic name was Inniswitrin, the Glass Isle. And they were islands, because the seas were higher. So he, they land on one of the little islands, which today is called Weary All Hill. And you can imagine, because they were all weary, you see. So they walk up the hill with his staff, and it was some people in his entourage, they're tired and a bit fed up, and they asked a miracle, just to give them a bit of hope. So he struck his staff into the ground, and it sprouted leaves and flowers, and that became what is known as the Holy Thorn of Glastonbury. And there is a sign still on Weriall Hill of this Holy Thorn, although it has been... Um, vandalized quite a few times not very long ago about two years ago it was cut down again but there are other ones around um, Glastonbury and you know it because and I've checked this in December it will blossom and in May now so now we think oh well that's a sweet little Glastonbury legend might be true might not but the interesting thing is apparently a sprig of the blossom of the holy thorn is sent to the Queen's table for every Christmas lunch so there we go. So now, when we walk past our Hawthorne, we look at this, this tree in awe, because she's been through all that. There she's been. <coughs> and she is so much greater than we are. So this is um, the point of having a relationship with plants. I'm one of those herbalists. I grow and gather a lot of my own herbs. And I gather them, I take them into my apothecary, and we distill them, or we turn them into oils, or creams, or tinctures, or glycerins. And my apothecaries have a lot more in common with the 17th century apothecaries of, say, Nicholas Culpepper's time, than they do with the modern pharmacies of today. Even though herbal medicine was, and remains still, the building block of modern pharmaceuticals. But this is how medical herbalists are taught, and to a great degree, um, doctors and pharmacists are taught that plants contain biochemicals which affect healing on our bodies. That's how we get better, through plants or medicines. But in terms of the history of mankind, this is a relatively recent worldview. The indigenous people um, do not think like this. The indigenous people have a spiritual interaction with plants. And this is very much akin to the way our ancestors of Britain had a relationship with plants. They had an animistic worldview, which means everything had a spirit. So, um, as I spend my hours gathering my plants for my apothecaries, I feel like I've developed a bit of a relationship with the plants, and it's a little bit like they've become, some of them have become my friends. And funnily enough, my favorite is nettle. Even though every summer I'm covered with scratches and burns, I love nettle. So, um, out of interest, if I heard an interesting story, an old folklore story about a certain plant, I'd just write it down. And over the years, I gathered, gathered the folklore, little bits of hidden history, um, anecdotes, um, legends, and also the associations with sacred rituals of this land. And then later on, I became a druid, and so I deepened my relationship with herbs through um, certain specific ceremonies which we have with certain, herb, certain plants of the year. Um, for instance, Beltane and Hawthorne, which we'll be celebrating um, starting tomorrow, actually. So I think it's very interesting to, to explore how the ancient people of this land might have thought about plants. And try to imagine now, a long time ago, several thousand years ago, this island was covered in a primeval forest. Not completely, it was a bit mottled, but it was mostly covered in a primeval forest. And so... The two to five million inhabitants who lived on this island, they would have cleared areas 
so that they could cultivate their fields and build their houses. And so you can imagine these inhabitants always lived very close against the forest. Now, if they cleared the forest, naturally, scrub-type plants will grow up, and so it creates a rough type of hedge. And this hedge creates a sort of inside-outside type of environment. And inside the clearing is domesticity and order and um, safety. And the hedge protects you from the dark forest on the other side. On the other side of the forest, you have bears, wild boars. Up on the hills, you have dragons. They completely believed in dragons. And you had wolves. And then inside the forest, in the dells and the recesses, you also had the elven at all, like these little Victorian elves that we were brought up on. These were beings who were to be greatly feared, and they were angry at humans because humans were slowly stealing their forest home, and they were an annoyed. And so the people would, would tread very carefully around elven areas because they didn't want to incur the wrath of the elves because they could be, their vengeance could be terrible. So they've cleared away a certain area and along the hedgerow naturally more meadow loving herbs will come up and it is towards these herbs that the folk would definitely have turned to gather their medicines just, just like I do today. So let's imagine now we have a scenario um, we're, we're in our little village, um, let's imagine our Celtic roundhouses, and a woman is suddenly, she suddenly, very suddenly takes ill. She has a sharp pain in her side, and she can't breathe, and she's gasping for breath, and she's full of fever, sweating, and she's coughing, but not getting any better. She's getting weaker and weaker, and her life force is hemorrhaging. Well, what do they do? But they call the healer of the village, maybe he was the wizard, they call him, and he pulls out of his herb bag a herb that he would have collected from the hedgerow around about September, October, September of the year before. And the name of this plant is, um, sorry, uh, before I tell you the name of the plant, he diagnoses this woman with a sharp pain with elf shot. So elf shot is the elves, somehow she's annoyed the elves, she's incurred their wrath, they've got invisible arrows and shot her, that's why she felt that sharp pain in the side. You can't see her arrows, but he knows, he can see, and he says they're there. So she has elf shot. He pulls out of his bag this herb called elf wart. So wart, in the, it's an Anglo-Saxon word, comes from the Anglo-Saxon word wart, which means herb. So you would have a, a wart yard or an elf wart, elf wart. And this is the plant that we use to clear, to cure elf shot. Perhaps also the disease might have been caused by flying venoms. So a wizard from a remote village might have been annoyed or paid to do a spell and he sent the flying venoms to this woman and they've infected her. So then he might have, he, and he would have, collected some resins from some pine trees. He's collected the resins and he will then have a little um, brazier of coals and he'll throw the resins on the coals and the incense will shoot up into the air and the whole the roundhouse will be filled with this very fragrant incense. Now if we think about pine, pine if you walk in a pine forest the air is, smells very clean and very pure. You imagine a pine on the top of a mountain, it's in clear air. Even Dr. Batch he associated pine with clearing away the feelings of guilt. So, pine, And even in our domestic products, they are fragranced with pine. So pine is associated with clearing and cleaning. We would have called the illness that this lady has, we would have called it pleurisy. She has a sharp pain, she can't breathe, she's coughing, and she's losing, she's becoming exhausted. We would have used a plant called Inula Helenium. Today it's called Inula Helenium. It was once called elf wart. And we may also use pine syrup. In Provence, they use pine syrup. Both of these plants are natural expectorants. Both of these plants are natural antibiotics. And so we see we have the same disease and the same treatments, just a totally different context. So the people of Britain, not even not very long ago, they um, lived in very close proximity with nature. They didn't have the distractions of the internet or television, and so they 
they observed nature very, very closely. And you can imagine, even, even after the war, really, we didn't have a lot of access to fresh fruit and vegetables, but let's go back hundreds of years, and you can imagine a cold, long, damp winter, and you've lived off meat and salted fish and a few wrinkly old apples and, and carrots, so you are not very vital. You are not very well nourished at all and um, probably their skin might have come up in a type of eczema, they might have had aches and pains in their joints because they're full of toxins. So they would have observed, they would have seen the, um, the birch tree and noticed that the sap is rising and they would have also noticed that the herbage is rising so everything's going upward and after the, the cold dark winter when everything seems dead, the tree seems dead, the earth seems dead, there's a renewed life and vigour and they wanted to magically imbibe this figure into their own bodies. So they would have tapped the birch and they would have collected the water and drunk that water. They probably would have fermented it as well and enjoyed that. Now the birch water is a natural detoxifying agent. So it would have cleared away all the toxins in the skin and their joints. It's a natural anti-inflammatory and they would have felt a whole lot better. They would have also probably collected nettles and um, watercress and sorrel and turned that into pottages or soups. Now there's an old recipe and it's the oldest recipe in Britain and it's called nettle pudding. And it's apparently 6,000 years old. And what they did is they collected nettles, sorrel, watercress, they chopped them all up and mixed it with barley meal and a bit of salt and then they made it wet with water so that it was quite sticky and they would have wrapped that and tied it up in a cloth of linen and dropped that into the pot where they were cooking venison or wild boar and they left it there through all the hours that the meat was cooking and then they'd take the meat out, take the nettle pudding out, open it up and they'd have meat, bread and nettle pudding for their, for their dinner. And Sam Samuel Pepys reports that nettle pudding is absolutely delicious and I think I must um, endeavour to give it a go this summer. You see that um, the ancients relied on the hedgerows. They relied on the hedgerow for physical protection. They used the plants of the hedgerow to protect them magically against elves. They used it for medicines and for food. They had an animistic worldview. Everything had a spirit. Mountain ranges, storms, fires, rocks, everything had a spirit. And plants had a spirit. And they called a plant upon plants for their medicines, their food, and for their protection. And so they were in awe of plants, and they respected plants, and they saw them as beings of plants, uh, beings of power. Excuse me. And so we can see evidence of that in in um, the 10th century leech book called the Luknanga, where they have the nine herbs charm, and one of the herbs that they address is mugwort. Now mugwort today is just a nothing plant, it's a weed, nobody's interested in it, nobody thinks anything of it. But a thousand years ago they addressed, addressed mugwort like this, and they said, remember mugwort, what you made known, what you advised at the great proclamation of the gods, Una you were called, eldest of all the warts. You prevailed against the three and the thirty. You prevailed against the venom and that which flies. You prevailed against the loathsome foe which roves this land. Now probably the loathsome foe was plague. But mugwort, its name is Artemisia vulgaris. And from Artemisia we can get Artemisinin. And Artemisinin is known to be excellent against cancer and malaria. So in our modern day, those are our loathsome foes. And we see, even a thousand years later, the plants are still serving us with their generosity. So today there is a huge revival in um, using plant medicine domestically, in foraging for wild food, and people are also fascinated by the old stories of plants and their traditional uses, and also communicating with them and using them in ritual. So if we go back now to our birch, and, and we know now that the leaves are therapeutically used to detoxify the body, but also probably most of you know that the, the branches and the twigs were used to make brims, and they were used to clean out houses, but they were also used to magically get rid of evil spirits. And so today, uh, they were also used um, as a whip for naughty boys to cleanse them of their evil ways. 
So today, um, in, in modern paganism, we would perhaps wear a, a, an oam beech, a birch little talisman like this, a little pendant, or we'd carry a wand or just a twig or even just a leaf, or we'd just go to the tree. This would be at a time when we want to get rid of energies in our life which no longer serve us, behaviors of ours which no longer serve us, maybe insecurity, maybe somebody in our life, maybe um, an un uh, not a very good tenant, whatever we want to go, we want to cleanse out that which is no longer good, the negativity. Foresters also, they know beech as a pioneer tree, so you can imagine when the land is cleared, the first trees that come up are the birch trees, and the birch is like a nursery, it creates a nursery forest. It, 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 um, protects against the sun, it protects against the wind, and the plant doesn't long, live very long. It lives about a hundred years, which is a short period of time for a tree, and then it dies, and it breaks down very quickly, so it nourishes the earth. And so then the longer-lived trees, like the oaks and the ash, they can come up and create a, you know, a forest that can live forever, really. So, the, so we see birch also as a tree which, um, which is a pioneer, it's about new beginnings. So now for us, we would, we would use birch when we want to get rid of the old. You cannot have new beginnings until you've got rid of that which is no longer good for you. So the birch is for getting rid of the old and for new beginnings, perhaps moving a house, a new job, a new relationship, a new, a new project, you would be thinking of birch. So today we are said to suffer from nature deficit disorder. And there is a great longing to return to the earth, and we long to find our way back home. Reconnecting with the, the rhythms of nature and with the rhythms of earth bring us back to ourselves. Um, we slow down, we think more clearly, we feel more acutely, and by loving nature, we love more tenderly, and we remember that we are part of the web of life. So we rejoin the other members of the web of life, and we remember the healing of plants and the wisdom of animals and the vastness of mountain ranges and the skies and the seas. And we find in, in connecting with nature in that way, we find our wildness and our innocence. And in so doing so, we come home to ourselves. Nettle. Why have I got a strong feeling for nettle? Um, well, I do this wonderful little, when I run workshops, I do this lovely little trick, I call it green magic, um, and what we do is we take a, a leaf of nettle and, and we love it, you know, and we, and we, we tell it how beautiful, we, we say how beautiful you are, and we stroke it like a little pet, and I show people, and they all do it, they, they stroke it on their arms, across their face, and it doesn't sting you, and I say to them, you can imagine if, if throughout all your lifetime, so for nettle, thousands and thousands of years, people have avoided you, you know, and hated you because you sting, you're going to feel a little bit hurt, a bit put out. So possibly for the first time ever, a group of people are loving you. And um, I just grew to love nettle. And I noticed that we do this with the nettle and it never stings. But when you put it down and start talking about another plant, it it's, it's sort of has a little jealous rage. And if you touch it, it absolutely zaps you. So um, my first really communication with plants, and it's very basic, is I'd be collecting plants and then nettle would sting me and I'd think, okay, okay, I'll move on. You know, it was like a little message. And now I like my scratches and I like my nettle stings and after a day, you know, collecting and I get into the bath and they zing up again, I just feel a certain fondness for them. But try it, try and pick a leaf and, and stroke it like a little pet and you'll see it, it makes your heart just break with love for it. Well, that was, I, I was trying to convey that in the story, you know, with, with um, the Beltane. It's very strongly linked with Beltane and, and with the Glastonbury. But it's all about the heart. It's all about, um, a lot of people, I think one of the things I like to say is, if you look at the Hawthorne, it's not all like real love. It's not all pretty petals. There are thorns and it's misshapen. It's, some might say it's an ugly tree. But like real love, it endures. It endures, yeah. There's something, it, it's, it's a tree of the heart. You, you, even though it's not 
perhaps the most beautiful tree. It is beautiful. It's so beautiful, and we we have a love for it. But its its whole mythology is is based around um, the heart. There are some actually some not such nice things said about Hawthorne. It used to be that if you brought Hawthorne in, um, the, the, the theory that people used to go mad about that, and you couldn't bring Hawthorne into the house because that meant you were a witch. Only witches could bring Hawthorne into the house, and if you did bring it into the house, your mother would die. And then there are other, um, other bits of information which say, well, the fragrance of the Hawthorne smells a little bit like a woman if she's sexually aroused, and also like corpses. It's not a very nice combination. <laughs> I was told not to say that, but I'm afraid this is what they say. And there's a chemical called trimethylamine, which smells like rotting bodies. But I will say, I will say this, just to sort of back myself out of a not a very nice corner. If you smell the whole thorn flower when, she, when it's a young flower, <coughs> it's a lovely fresh smell. Uh, over the weeks, as she becomes older, it does become a little bit more less pleasant. So perhaps that's more the corpse end. <laughs> And the other end, she always says, more the maiden end. Mm. Me personally, or do I know about it? It's, it's a dream as her. So, um, yes, I have used it. Um, I find it gives you a, quite a jarring sleep. You don't sleep very well. It's a little bit like when you've had too much to drink and you think you're going to sleep well, but you don't. You've got this erratic sleep. But some people say that it brings on lucid dreams. And I think in some folk it does, and in some folk it doesn't. But it's supposed to open up your dreams so that you, can, you will have a question when you go to sleep, and then you drink the tea or you sleep with it under your pillow, and perhaps you remember your... Well, I suppose you're, you're consciously dreaming. And um, Nigel knows quite a lot about that, conscious dream, Nigel. Um, and um, so you're probably consciously dreaming and using this plant as almost like a horse to carry you into your dream world and bring it back consciously. So it would be a little bit shamanic, bringing your dream back into the conscious world. I'm sure it does. Why it does, I don't know. Maybe it stimulates the pineal gland, you know. Um, I don't know, but it has got a very strong reputation as the dreamer's herb, or, you know, conscious dreaming as well, seeing. Mm. It's also used in smudge, you know. It, you know, it's a smudge stick, but it's the British smudge, and you can... You can use it for smudging. It's got a lovely smell. Beautiful. Mm. Most of these uh, herbs dried, or, or do you use them fresh? Or? Me? Yes. Right. Well, it depends. Okay. It depends. Fresh is best. Fresh is lovely because you've got the vital force, but it doesn't really go. You can capture it. I mean, the herbs were always dried to preserve them for the winter, but you don't want to keep them for too long, then they become a little bit musty. But I, I do think fresh is best. Yeah. And, um, well, they did have barley, they did have some crops, but if you think about what would have been available to them back those thousand years, they would have, you know, think about our winters, what would we find? What about turnips and things like that? Yes, I'm sure, but eventually they, you know, after well, how long are our winters? They last forever, don't they? Yeah. So they would have shriveled up and got a bit mouldy. Yeah. You know, so in the end, what would they have been left with? Meat is around through the year. Um, they would have had preserved fish and these wrinkly vegetables until the <coughs> next season came. It's not very appealing, no. But, but it's not even healthy. No. They didn't live as long as we did. No, but that is why they looked with such eagerness. I mean, can you imagine the joys of wild garlic? We seize upon it so excitedly these days. But, you know, and nettle soup is one of our, our biggies. But can you imagine how excited they must have been when these, when these plants came? It, it must have been, you know, a miracle. And, of course, the, you know, dead, seemingly dead um, trees came to life. It must have been a, a, a huge cause for celebration. It's just said acorns were used widely, and do I know anyone who's making food from acorns? No, I'm afraid I don't. Uh, no, I have no idea. I think you do have to leach the acorns of their tannins, but I'm sure they would have known just what to do about them. Yeah, yeah. I know during the war they used um, horse chestnut for, um, for animal food, and they used to collect the chestnut, break it up, and soak it, to get rid of um, some of the chemicals and then feed that to the horses so that the grains were um, to be fed for humans. But 
I, I, I don't think it was a very healthy diet, but they did the best they could under the circumstances. Mm. <laughs> it's a cure, but ribwort is better. Okay. Do you know ribwort? No. Oh, you do know it. It's very common. It's as common as dark. And if you saw it, it's, it's, it's got a long leaf. It's flat. You do know it because it's got those little stalks and a, and a bubble at the top, and people used to shoot it. With okay. Kids used to... Sh you used to shoot it. Kids used to shoot it. They'd, they'd, they'd make a little loop and then pull it, and this thing would go fly. It was like a pea shooter that you'd find on the ground. Anyway, it's awfully common, and it's got these ribs, hence wart, you know, once again, the, the ribbed herb. And, and so when you look out for it, you'll see it. Plantain is its other common name. And, and so you pick it, and you just rub it on the nettle or chew it into a poultice and then put it on the sting. And it can be an animal sting or a, or a nettle sting, and it kills the pain immediately. It's fantastic. Mm. Well, this is what I do. It's a good point, because people always say, oh, you know, ask the plant's permission. But humans being humans, they're going to say, oh, yeah, the plant said I could have, have a branch of it. You know, because we want the branch, so we're going to say, oh, yeah, it said. So, so before I leave home, I say to, um, I might say to, the elder, the, there's the goddess who lives in the elder, her name is Helda Moore. So uh, before I leave home, I'll, I'll say to her, you know, Helda Moore, I'm, I, please, please, um, would you bless this day as I come to collect your, your flowers, and I'm so grateful for the healing that you bring my patients, and, and the joy that I have in collecting your flowers, and please guide me to find the trees that you want me to harvest from, and show me which flowers to pick, and really, you 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 can you lean up to pick one and then you think no rather you know you just automatically pulled that way. Now there are times when I'm lazy and I haven't asked, and I can assure you that you struggle mm. to get that little twig off the tree. And but when you ask permission and you just follow your instinct, you know your fancy as it were. Oh yes, this one wants to said I can pick it. It pops off, almost throws itself into your hands. So. Maybe it's just a fanciful idea, but this is my experience. I ask with huge gratitude, and I am in, I am in awe of plants. In fact, Nigel, my publisher over there, um, I, I, he asked me how am I getting on with my speech, and I said, um, I burst into tears, which was rather, I think he was horrified. And I said, it was because I'm in awe of the plants. They're just incredible, you know. They're just incredible. So it wasn't at my good wordsmithing, it was at the plants. <laughs> <coughs> well, thanks to Joe. Go around and have Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>